Hey everybody, it's Romania Black, and we are on episode 10 of Chainsaw Man. Hmm. So the last two episodes have been, um, insane. <laughs> Quite a bit. And I, they, it's really weird because I have no clue where the story is going at this point. Not a clue. I'm assuming that we're gonna just pick up where we left off at, but that's what I thought last episode, and then Makima went crazy. So... I, I honestly don't know where we're going to at this point. We ended the last episode with Makima giving her her whole Tokyo cuisine is to die for sort of thing. And it kind of just like ended, right? But there's clearly some things like the sword, the blade, sword devil, and um, Sawatari. They got away. Um, they managed to escape. Um, Kobeni is with Dinji and assuming Aki as well. Power, we don't know where she is. Uh, Makima's on her way back to Tokyo with the two new people um, that are following her that seem like they could be siblings, could be lovers, we don't know. And there's just a lot happening, but there's a lot of gray area and big question marks of what's going to happen now. And I really like that. I like going in this blind and having no clue what's going to happen. And the Discord, I just peek into the Discord every now and then. There's like such a crazy chat going on the Discord for Chainsaw Man 24-7. I'll just occasionally like peek into the, it's like I peek into the Discord and it's just like black box, black box, black box. And I'm like, okay, we're good. And then I just kind of peace out. It's great. I love it. I, I absolutely love it. Y'all go crazy. You're, you're doing you're not hurting me at all <laughs> but i do have quite a lot of comments from episodes eight and nine so far as we go into this episode so forgive me if this is a bit of a long intro um but moon I talked about how in the discord moon was saying that fujimoto tends to and i quote run over everyone without looking back <laughs> as an author and for me i equated it to be like to me fujimoto is that person playing grand theft auto but they don't care about the storyline they're just trying to get as many gold stars as possible until the tanks and the helicopters start coming in they've ran over enough hookers with money that they've got the tanks on them and that's fujimoto to me <laughs> Because he really doesn't care. He's like, oh, you don't want me to kill off main character? Too bad I'm going to. Oh, you don't think I can do this? Too bad I'm going to. And that's kind of his attitude. But I thought that was really, really funny, Moon. I love that idea of Fujimo just runs over everybody and doesn't look back. I love it. Um, also, Moon was talking about how the Dark Trio... Uh, as it's known in manga, is actually not Akatami, Fujimoto, and Horikoshi, but is considered to be Akatami, Fujimoto, and Yuji Kaku, who is the creator of Hell's Paradise. Yet another series that MAPPA has decided to take under its wing instead of finishing Ice Adolescence like I would like them to five years ago. I, I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> Just throwing it out there, Mappa, if you want to finish that movie about gay men and figure skating before you take on another heavy series drama, that'd be great. <laughs> so, but apparently that's the dark trio that, um, and Yuki, Yuji Kaku does Hell's Paradise, which, and apparently Kaku is Fujimoto's like BFF. So, okay. I mean, I want to see Hell's Paradise. It looks trippy. It looks cool. I'm all for it. I just you know, Mappa quit taking on things. And so, but apparently Fujimoto's best friend, Yuki Kaku, Yuji Kaku says that Denji's character talks exactly like Fujimoto does. So I'm like, hmm, that's really cool. I like that. Uh, Thestral talked about the crowd. I did get confused with this. And Thestral, I'm glad that you clarified this. In the last episode, there were people on the train like saying the word guns. I thought it was the goons that had shot Makima and the other guy. But Thestral pointed out that it was actually the crowd on the train saying guns and not the guys, which I'm sure by this point y'all have commented about it as well. That is a that is a problem when I go back to rewatch the episode since I don't have the sound on. Now you've brought up a really good point, Thestral, that when that happens again, I may just like edit it out of the discussion, but I may listen to that clip again so I'll know that would have helped out. So thank you for pointing that out. Alessia Colley says that um, Alessia Colley was having a debate with Alex Cornejo on Patreon about the idea of sacrificing. They weren't really having a debate, but they were commenting together about it, about sacrificing the innocent versus the criminals that Makima uses for the sacrifice. And I thought that was really interesting because, yeah, on the one hand, good for Makima for using, you know, convicted criminals instead of just rando innocent people. But I thought about it and I think that there's actually something to that, right? I think there could be something to that. And I'm curious if we're going to get more on Makima. My theory is that maybe choosing criminals that had 
like life sentences or worse if there was like a fear attached to them because people are afraid of serial killers right you know they're afraid of a serial killer because they could hurt them so that fear attached to those men or the negative energy or emotions attached to them maybe makima chose them because they had all this negative energy surrounding them and it made it more powerful or transferable to kill the guys on the other end I don't know, but that was just my head cannon. I thought it was interesting though. Plus, if you kill people that are on death row or life sentences or worse, if they die, is the public really going to care? That's, you know, if it was an innocent person, it could come back on Makima in a very bad way. But is the public really going to cry out against like a bunch of murderers being killed? That's interesting. So I'm glad you brought that up, Alicia. That was really good. Uh, speaking of Alex Cornejo, they brought about the idea that um, there's kind of a similarity and a parallel between Light Yagami and Misa from Death Note and Makima and Dinji in Episode 9. That Dinji kind of like follows Makima around, similar to how Misa follows Light around. I'm just saying, a crossover pairing between Makima and Light Yagami, I've never seen Light Yagami as heterosexual, but that might change my mind. <laughs> Or, or Light just might be Makima sexual because he thinks that she would, you know, he would admire her prowess, perhaps. I don't know. Light's pretty full of himself. I don't know if that would go over very well. Um, Christopher Peterson talked about... Uh, Christopher Peterson had some really good questions in their comment asking, you know, Aki... Did Aki take the ghost devil or is it gone? Was the ghost devil revving up Dingy's engines, so to speak, the last act before it vanished? I don't know. I said that I kind of don't want Aki to have the ghost devil because as cool and symbolic as that could be, Aki's got enough contracts on him. He's got a contract with the fox devil. He's got a contract with the curse devil. He really doesn't need to take on a third contract, especially since the ghost devil seems to take a bit from you like it took Himeno's eye. Aki's already got the fox devil nibbling off its flesh and he's giving his lifespan literally away to the curse devil. He really doesn't need to give any more of himself up. If I'm being honest, I don't think so. But there were other questions that Christopher asked. Like one, how did Makima get the names? That was what inspired me to make the Death Note comparison in the last episode. But yeah, so it's one thing, did a devil help her to get the names? That's one thing. But if she already knew the names prior, then what do we do with that? I thought, I theorized, and I, was, I told Christopher I was gonna talk about it in this episode. I theorize that maybe we've seen stuff with Makima's eyes throughout this entire series, like we see her doing this in the OP and stuff. I wondered if once, I wondered if she has seen you or imprinted on you and you see someone, she can kind of look through your eyes and maybe know their names. That maybe she could use the devil to look through your eyes and see. So like if I had imprinted with Makima and I went out and looked at Huckleberry, Makima could see through me Huckleberry and know who it was. I don't know. That That's pretty far-fetched and out there. But I just thought it might be a cool mechanic that maybe that's how she knew the names. But yeah, but then, you know, it brings up like Makoda. He's like, how much did she know going into this? And why did she not go after Sawatari and the Blade Devil? Why did she let them go? If she killed all the other ones, was it that the prisoners only had enough energy to kill the randos and not devils themselves or people with contracts? Maybe the thing of it is that the guys that were killed did not have contracts with devils, so they could be, but people like Sawatari and the Blade Devil who have made contracts with devils cannot just be killed by the ritual that Makima does in that moment. Maybe that's it. Um... How much of this is Makima's plan? What are her overall goals? That's like a big question. What are her overall goals? And I don't know if we're going to even touch that this season, but that's something to think about. And so, yeah, the Blade Devil, uh, finally, Christopher, Chris, of Christopher Peterson's comment, he says the Blade Devil, you know, he seems to want revenge on Dingy, but he also wants revenge on the Gun Devil. So, yeah, I feel like the Blade Devil kind of is almost like a double agent. He just wanted to get revenge on Dingy for his grandpa, but he also wants to take the Gun Devil down, too. So... Blade Devil Redemption Arc, I'm here for it. If we get like Blade Devil backstory and he becomes like a Redemption Arc character or, or ends up working with Dingy and all them, I'm here for it. I love a good anti-hero or would-be antagonist that kind of like gets over onto the, the protagonist good guy side and then slowly like he's not with them, but he's kind of begrudgingly with them. I love characters like that. So I'm here for it. If we do something like that, mm -hmm. all right, I'm, I'll do it. Uh, Sam Mala talks about how, um, and this is one thing, I, I don't really want to know what is 
anime only and what is manga only at this point. And I say that, and I want to use this as an example, because I was told that the Kobini shooting her killer was anime only. Makima dressing herself before she goes off to do the rituals, anime only. And that stuff's fine. But then the stuff about the inmate's last meal, that that was anime only, I was like, well... Dang it, now I can't theorize about it because I know it has no bearing on anything in the story. And I know some people will argue and be like, well, it's good that you know that. But I'm like, I love theorizing. And so now it's kind of like, womp, womp, damper on that. So please don't tell me what is manga only and what is anime only. Don't tell me. I don't want to know. And if I see your comments starting to do that, I'll just stop reading. So please don't do that. Um, Badal Singh says, in episode 8 in the ED, there's a Goodbye Airy poster on the wall, which is one of Fujimoto's one-shots. And I freaking love Goodbye Airy. I've reread it I don't know how many times since I did my reaction on the channel for it. It's so good. And I love it so much. So I'm going to have to go back to the ED and look at that because I love it. And then apparently, Badal said that Denji using an axe while he's a human way back in the hotel episodes, um, it makes sense because what's the precursor to a chainsaw? An axe. I'm like, ah, I love it. Love it. So then a uh, non-binary Jit Lung, again, I told you all this was a long intro. <laughs> There's a lot of comments. Non-binary Jit Lung said that the Chainsaw Man world, it's very all or nothing. And I definitely agree with that, that there's a lot of themes in this story that deal with like humanity and its complexity versus the natural order of the world, which seems very concrete and resolute. And I feel like that's Fujimoto's writing style. Fujimoto's writing style in the one shots, there's a lot of like minimalist, absolute thematic elements. Like it's all this way or that way. There's not a lot of gray area. And I would argue that there is gray area in this story, but there's still that big like, it's either, it goes to the extremes very easily, more so than I think other authors do. And that, that kind of is an acquired taste in some sense that if you don't like that, you'll be like, mm, this is too much. Um, I'm fine with it. I like it. It. I do appreciate, I think I appreciate the most because I'm aware of it and that that's their writing style. If I hadn't read the one shots, I'm very curious how I would feel about this series because I'd be like, wow, this is an extreme series. But reading the one shots, you kind of get a better understanding of him as a writer. And I'm like, okay, I see the style you're going for. I like it. I'll deal with it. Okay. And so that, that helps out a lot. But I'm glad you pointed that out, non-binary Jitlung. And then um, Himeno also wanted I, Aki to become this ideal for her, this ideal of hope. I do like what your comments said, um, Jitlung, about the idea that Himeno was kind of not grooming. I don't like, I think that word gets overused a little bit in um, current media, especially when talking about series like this. But I do think she was trying to make Aki be this ideal hero to her and was trying to help shape him and mold him to be what she wanted him to be. And in that regard, if that's true, it may not be in the most tragic of ways, it may not be a bad thing that Aki didn't keep going down that route. Because again, I was like, when he first started taking up smoking, I'm like, dude, you're hurting yourself and you're just doing it for her. So maybe it'll be healthier for him to get out of that toxic relationship. As much as I like Aki and Himeno together, there is a toxicity to that relationship. And so I'm kind of glad that he's not gonna have to worry about that in a sense. It's still really tragic. I didn't want him to die, but their relationship had a toxicity to it that it might not be a bad thing that he doesn't have it, but it's still gonna be really horrifically sad that she's gone and he's gonna have to deal with that. So there you go. And then finally, Alexander Q talked about Makima and the lollipop in episode nine and the idea of making something not in her favor go in her favor. And I love that comment, Alexander Q. I love that. And it's the idea that Makima, she realized there's a situation where Denji was potentially being hit on by Himeno and was being drawn away from her. And she was like, mm, I don't like that. And so she used the lollipop to just whip him back in. And on the one hand, it's great. I do like on the one hand that Denji has something positive out of that entire experience because good God, he needs something positive out of it. So if it's chupa flavored Coca-Cola lollipops, do it to it, Lars. But on the other hand, it is a form of manipulation by Makima. And so it's like, it's like, we'll, we'll take what we can get in this series, right? We'll take what we can get. And I've talked for almost 15 minutes. So, but those comments were amazing. Thank you all so much. Um, as I've said before, please, no spoilers, no hints or clues, um, nothing from the manga. I, I'm staying anime only on this, so. 
But y'all, I'm so excited. I, the thing is on Tuesdays, I stay off social media. If I get like a notification, I'll check the notification, but I don't scroll. I don't get on anything. I honestly stay off the Chainsaw Man Discord channel on Patreon on Tuesdays because I'm like, I want nothing. I want to go in blind as a bat, <laughs> blind as the bat devil in this uh, episode. And that's what I'm doing. So we'll see. It's pouring down rain outside, which is weird this time of year, but it feels, it feels um, thematic with Chainsaw Man. So let's see what we get y'all, shall we? We're going to start episode 10 of Chainsaw Man and we're going to do that here in three, two, one, and let's do this. <laughs> the master character we don't really get his name in this yet do we no he's just the teacher he's just called teacher he loves when people call him teacher and he loves lots of things he likes booze and women and killing devils and maybe a little bit sadistic <laughs> i love suda as a voice actor because no matter what role he plays he has this like effortless cool to him but for some reason in this role of this character which it fits his personality his personality he's completely unhinged but in the chillest way possible right and so i feel like they just got suda out of bed at 3 a.m and we're like we need you to record this right now we need you in this state and he's like oh okay sure <laughs> you know? I love Suda though too. He's a man among men, right? And it's funny that he plays a very, we talk about Akutami and Fujimoto. He plays a very Nanami type character, except Nanami in Jujutsu Kaisen, without spoiling anything, Nanami is the adult of all adults. He is the most straight laced, very by the book, like does things properly. And he has, he's very straight laced, has the tile left up. And he's, he's very, you know, by the book. He's a very pragmatic person very you know even keel this guy comes off that way on the surface and then you see him with the flask and you're like oh well he's just a little you know he's just a little laid back no he's sadistic and he's, he's got some screws loose and he loves the fact that he can train dingy and power because they're just like him he's just so chill about it it's like but again we've talked about in this series that these devil hunters have become desensitized to killing and losing people and everything else so it does not seem that far-fetched that he would be that way. So it's like, okay, man, this episode felt really long, didn't it? I felt like I kept waiting for the ED to click and the, the intro was really long. And then I kept waiting for the ED to kick in and we kept getting more and more, which I was glad, but I was like, I feel like I'm getting spoiled. I feel like we're getting more than I should. I feel like everything went by really quickly and lots of things happened, but... In true Fujimoto fashion, this is not the aftermath episode that you think it's going to be, right? It's not the aftermath episode that you think it's going to be. And it's it's good that it's like that. But I want to put up here that there is this idea of what Fujimoto does with expectation versus reality of episode 10. I'm very curious what we're going to end this season off at. I really am at this point. And obviously, I don't want spoilers. I don't want hints or clues or anything like that. I'm going to be really curious where we leave off at because we only have two episodes left. We've got two episodes left of the season. And so far, we're setting up some things. We're setting up a, a training arc at this point, which is crazy at this point of the season that we're having a training arc. Usually, you'd have that earlier on, right? But we're having a training arc in the 11th hour. For what? We don't know. Um, but Makima's left them with him. Also, it is convenient that Makima has left them with him because she knows he's going to keep them busy. We'll talk about that. Makima was very odd this episode, honestly. But it's setting up, we're doing a training arc with two episodes left. A training arc for what, you may ask? Well, we're just going to make Dingy and Power stronger. To what end, right? I feel like it's just training them up for something. Um, and then Aki, now the Aki part at this point in the season makes sense that he's making this final contract with this future devil, which we'll talk about it, but that kind of makes sense with Aki's character, right? It makes sense with Aki's character who we'll talk about Aki. I'm like, my brain is like with his character, but we're, we're setting up like this final contract 
to what end. And then I feel like they, it's interesting because I feel like we're not going to face the gun devil, obviously by the end of this season. The gun devil is like a boss way down the road. We got to face blade devil first. We got to face Sawatari first. We might have to face Makima first. Like, like the gun devil and maybe Makima is the final villain. I don't know. But I, we've got to face a lot of things before we even get to the gun devil. So I don't think we're going to get to him in two episodes. Unless they do a giant time skip, which I don't think they're going to do. So, hmm, hmm. I feel like, much like Jujutsu Kaisen, Jujutsu Kaisen, I feel like I don't read the manga for it. But just from what I've been told... My brother reads the manga, and he's like, oh, yeah, they're way far ahead on the anime. And I was like, okay, so we'll have a while before we catch up with the manga. I feel like that's the same case with Chainsaw Man. I, we're obviously... I don't know where we're, we're going to end this. I really don't. Hmm. Which is kind of funny. Somebody in the Discord asked if I would read the manga after the season. And I was like, hmm. And they were like, you're going to have to wait a long time for the anime. And I'm like, hmm. <laughs> But I love being anime only with this show. I'm kind of that way with Jujutsu Kaisen. I know I have to wait. I've waited like two years for season two, but it'll be worth it when we get it. So, and, and plus I've got lots of shows that I can watch on this channel to bide my time until Chainsaw Man season two. That part doesn't bother me a bit. I, I'm a patient woman, if anything. Um, <laughs> but I, yeah, so I'm curious how they're going to end this season because we set up a lot of things in this episode that are very different than what I thought we were going to do. Very different. Things went in a totally different way than I thought. But at this point, I'm like, we have two episodes left. What are we setting up? Hmm. That mystery has me really excited. I'm excited to find out what that mystery is about, right? But let's go through this episode because we do eat quite a lot, right? There's the whole idea of the, the hospital aftermath. So, talk about expectation versus reality. I thought that they'd have... I thought that they would have to go and find power. I thought that was going to be a whole thing. We're going to go find power, go on a quest. That was going to be the rest of the season, if I'm being honest. I really thought we were going to have to do spend a whole episode going look for her. No. <laughs> no, she she came back. She came back after uh, running away. Of course, she won't admit to that. She's like, no, I was just going to go get some food. and I had to go to McDonald's and come back. I was just taking a break. It's like, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, she ran for sure. Uh, and we'll talk about that alongside. I want to talk about uh, some themes that are starting to, uh, some themes and uh, things to think about as we go into these last two episodes. Because we have two more episodes and then we're done with Chainsaw Man for the time being. So, hmm. Yeah, this is supposed to be like the Aftermath episode. Like where you lick your wounds and, you know, get back up. The episode's called Bruised and Battered. Which is exactly what our, our heroes are, so to speak. And so, yeah, I really thought we'd have to go look for power. But we did not. And so we go to Aki's uh, room. At, Nir at Nirima Nishidai, a building across... Okay, so they talk about yesterday afternoon at, Nir at Nirima Nishidai, building across from Nirima Station. Okay, so they're talking about something here. And we have the little apples in the little baskets to keep them from bruising each other. Which is funny, right? Talk about this episode being battered and bruised. And they have like a pack of... It's camel cigarettes. They just kind of cleverly hit it. But um, but yeah, they're not they're not the ravens. Mm -mm. They're not the ravens. The, the raven cigarettes that... Himeno had for him, which again is interesting because Dingy noticed the cigarettes that Himeno had for him. And a part of me wonders, there's a part of me that's, that's wondering on here about Dingy, we'll talk about Dingy and sentimentality at this point in the story, right? Dingy and sentimentality. I, there's a curious thing at play here because on the one hand, Dingy knew what type of cigarettes Himeno smoked and he made the comment a few episodes back that Aki was smoking the exact same type. Now, if Dingy were using his brain, he would put two and two together and be like, oh, maybe Aki's smoking those same cigarettes because they were recommended by Himeno. And when he knows Himeno likes Aki, maybe he's like, oh, ha Aki, Himeno wanted him to smoke the same cigarettes she did. So... On the one hand, you'd be like, well, why wouldn't wouldn't he know to get the same type of cigarettes for Aki? But then on the other hand, you could say, well, Dingy, either one isn't that observant. 
didn't put two and two together. Or you could say, too, maybe Dingy didn't want to get him the same type of cigarettes because he was afraid it would bring back a memory of him and O and she just died, so he didn't want that to happen to him. Now, 90% he probably did not pay that close of attention and put two and two together, just got him some cigarettes and that's it. 90% probably it. But there is that little percent that's like, maybe, maybe he was thinking of him, but we'll talk about that later. So we have the whole thing at Narima Station, Devil Hunters from public safety engaged in a large scale battle. However, there have been eyewitness reports that their opponents were humans in addition to devils, making the exact nature of the conflict. And then we get the thing, be silent. So, so there's this concept of, okay, for the most part, we've always had devils versus humans and that's why we have devil hunters but the conflict is going to get more complicated if we start having humans and devils working together against humans or against devil hunters things are going to start getting more complicated right which is rather interesting i like that it's caught by be silent and then aki waking up again aki is mappa has been bound and determined to make aki the most handsome character in this series why should we be surprised? And then, so we have Dingy, who's put his feet up on the hospital bed. Again, we're talking about Dingy and sentimentality. That he's just, he's just propped his feet up on the hospital bed, and he's eaten the apples that are meant for Aki, right? And he looks over, and he's not noticed that Aki's awake yet. So, we have the idea of, of the expectation, right? You have the expectation of Dingy and power... Uh, waiting on Aki to wake up versus them fighting over the apple while feet are props with the manga. That's kind of the crazy thing is that, you know, in any other shonen series, when a major, like, member of the trio were, were seriously injured and they wake up in the hospital bed, you'd see, like, the other two members of the trio being, like, at their bedside being like, we're so glad you're awake. Or they'd be like, the sun filter in, they'd be like, glad you're awake, friend. Let us go get revenge on what foe has, has wrought against us. No, in this version, Power and Denji are fighting over an apple. As he's trying to read a manga with his feet propped up on the bed. And they're not paying attention to Aki at all. <laughs> like. Because it's Chainsaw Man. And, and Fujimoto doesn't play that game. Fujimoto's like, yeah, that's what you would expect out of something, you know, a heartwarming shonen. This ain't your mama shonen. So I, I love that Aki wakes up to see these two boobs. This pair of boobs just sitting there being like they do. And I love the idea of Aki seeing his reflection in the television as Denji goes to grab the apple. And he's sitting there reading the manga. And I like that Power's like looking over his shoulder. Reading the manga with him. I One thing that I do love in this episode. Is the dynamic. The dynamic between Denji and Power. I love it. It's great. Um, do I ship Denji and Power? No. They are platonic besties. Power cares not of Dingy's fleshy mortal organs. She does not. She doesn't. They're, and they're both, like, at this point, it's questionable, like, how devilish is Dingy? Maybe quite more than we thought, right? Maybe quite more than we thought. And so what do we do with that? And then I, it's interesting. There's just, like, this kind of platonic, like, they care for each other in this weird devilish way. But Power and Dingy, they're like besties. They're like BFFs. But even Dingy says, I wouldn't mourn her. We'll talk about that. But Aki just sitting there in this pale light. And, and when Power looked over from Dingy to see the apple in his hand, I thought she was noticing Aki. It was like, oh, he's awake. She's noticing the apple. And she, they're like, they literally are like a bunch of animals in this episode. And that kind of makes sense with what Suda's character says. He's like, he's like, you animals never trust the words of a hunter. And it's like... Ah! But yeah, she sees the apple, and of course everybody in the hospital is like, what the hell? 
and they're fighting over, I don't know what kind of manga Dingy is reading, but she's like, relinquish the apple, I shall eat it. And he's like, no. He's like, hell no, they're all mine. I'm like, they're supposed to be hockeys. He's, he's the one that's in the hotel, in the hospital. And they're like, you ran, so no apples for you. And then she says, I did not run. I simply went, uh, grew hungry and went home. It just happened to be in the middle of a crucial battle. Uh, and they're like, no. And he's like, quit lying. You're a scaredy, a scaredy fiend. A scaredy fiend. A chicken. I love that he says scaredy fiend instead of scaredy cat. I love it. And she's like, you are the one who is lying. And then there they both are messing with it. And Aki breaks them up from what they're doing. I want to get this picture where they are like intertwined in each other's arms. The two of them are two sides of the exact same coin, this pair of boobs. And Aki says, Division Four. Did anyone survive? And, and I love the power! She just sort of grabs the apple as Dingy's thinking about it. She's just like, oh, yeah, whatever. Oh my god, you two. So yeah, so Aki wanting to know. Again, we have the idea at play here of Aki's Aki's humanity. His humanity versus dingy and powers devil side. All right. And the irony of it is that they're both very, very much representative. You have devil, dingy and power who are basically established to be nigh immortal at this point. Not quite immortal, but pretty much immortal. And then Aki, Aki has two years left. Maybe less, depending on what the future devil wanted. Two years. I thought, again, expectation versus reality, I thought that Aki would have until maybe his 30s or 40s. Nope. Two years or less. That's 24 months. That ain't long. At all. That is no time. Which helps explain why Aki's like, live in the moment. I got nothing to lose. I got two years to try to kill this gun devil before I die. <sighs> we'll talk about that when we get to it. But yeah, they both kind of look at each other. And Denji's like, that shrimp Kobeni, which I guess her, she's okay, and the glasses dude, I think. And so, so basically Kobeni and Makoda are the only survivors. So Suda wasn't there. But the only ones from Division 4 are Makoda and Kobeni. Okay. But then he says that he quit public safety. And Aki got that animation. That animation where Aki goes... Like, he just, he just, it's just like a breath. He takes a breath and goes, oh, he quit. Okay. So, it's literally on, the only ones left at this point are Aki and Denji, Power, Kobeni, and then we have Makima, uh, the two. I know that one is Tendo. Tindo and the one that starts with a K and then uh, Suda's character. So we got like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We got like eight members. Well, but then we have the fiend of the fiend, fiend of Fushi. We still don't know about that one. That one's somewhere. So, and, and Denji wouldn't know who that is. So there's like nine or ten left, but that's not a lot. But yeah, just that animation on Aki whenever he's like, like, okay, Makoto's gone. And I like that Dingy and Power both notice that he reacts that way. Like, we have hardly anyone left. That's not a good thing. And Dingy's just like, mm. Dingy's trying to think of what to say. Because Dingy, growing up, I, here's the thing about Dingy. He, you expect Dingy, the expectation is for Dingy to have this, like, pep talk. You know, like the shonen protagonist, oh, we'll get revenge on the gun devil, blah, blah, blah. Dingy doesn't know any of that stuff. He doesn't know. He hates revenge. Dingy thinks revenge is dumb. He has no time for it. So Dingy is pretty indifferent. The reality is he's indifferent to the aftermath. 
you know, any other shonen protagonist would be like deeply impacted. Deeply wow. impacted like Aki. Aki Aki in this episode is acting like the shonen protagonist. Aki is acting like we expect the shonen protagonist to act where he's like this is what is this? Like he's freaking out, internally screaming about everything going down. Like, what do I do now? What, what's going to happen now? What about my t colleagues, my teammates? He's crying over him and oh, Dingy is really indifferent because Dingy's not been there very long. He doesn't have a connection really with all these people. So unlike Aki, who's been there for three years and he's forged these connections, and as Himeno says, is extremely emotional. And, ha and wears his emotions on his sleeve and, and cries for everyone and isn't desensitized. Dingy kind of isn't, he wasn't sensitized towards it to begin with. So it's interesting. He says, Makima wants to talk to me and Powie. So we're going to head out. I love that he calls Power Powie. Like that's just their, their nicknames at this point. Like Power has like earned a nickname. She's like, I only came to eat the fruit you've been gifted. Power's like, I don't care. I'm just here for the fruit. No, Bye. And Denji sees how sad Aki is about all of this. Like, he just looks dejected. And Denji's like, well, what do I do? He's like, I'll leave you an apple. And he leaves it there. And he says, see ya. Which, again, is not what I expected at all. I expected, you know, you expect them all to, like, gather together and, like, help Aki feel better. No, not in Chainsaw Man. Mm-mm. They just, it's very hollow. And Aki's just left there with the apple, like, to think on things. But Denji, Denji's never really had to mourn anybody, right? Other than his father, he never really has had to mourn anyone. And so we'll talk about this with the whole Pachita thing. But he doesn't really know what to say to Aki. He's like, ah. And I expected Denji to talk with, I expected Denji to uh, talk about... Himeno to Aki, but what ends up happening is it's the sister brings the letter. That's what ends up happening instead. So, uh, so Aki does get some closure with Himeno, just not in the way that we expected as the audience. But Aki just looks so dead. And the room, it's this bare hospital room, and the stools are turned over from where Power and Dingy were arguing with one another. There's one apple left for him, and there's a manga laying on the ground, and it's just so desolate. And then poor Aki. He just sits there. I love the wide shots in this episode. There's so many good, like, silent wide shots in this episode. It's beautiful. And then he looks at the sword and reaches down to grab it. Mm-hmm. And asks, how many years does he have left? And I love that the devil like has the skulls and everything. And it says two years. And his hand like shakes as he puts it back. And at that point, it's like, okay, well at this point you got two years left. So what's the cigarettes going to hurt? And he goes to smoke one, but he can't do it. He can't do it. And that's, and then he thinks about him and no with the lighter and he can't do it. That's when he, and when he goes to grab it, that's when he just freaks out and cries and cries for her, which I'm glad he cried, but it's like, damn episodes. That's that shots really sad of him with the overturned chairs and everything. And he's just crying for her. And then Dingy hears on the other side of the door as Power's like obsessed with the light of the vending machine. And Dingy's like, what do I do? I love that Dingy's standing there. And I'm glad Dingy didn't go in because Aki needed that moment to himself to like do it. And the question is, did Dingy hear how much time Aki had left. I don't think he did. I don't think Dingy knows how much time Aki has left. I don't think he heard that part. I think he just went back to get his manga and heard him cry, right? Because he doesn't miss anything. He's like, I came back from a manga and the dude's crying. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, well, I can't blame him. A bunch of his work buddies are dead. Mm -hmm. And so that that's such an interesting thing because Dingy, and there's part of it that we could say it's because 
he's more devil than human than we thought. Perhaps there's there's that explanation. But then I also want to point out that Denji's never really, other than his dad, he's never really had to mourn anybody. And he even says, he's like, you know, he's, he was sad when he thought Pachita died, but that's the thing. I want to go back through this when we talk about this. He says his partner, Himeno, bought it too. And then Denji has this revelation. That he's like, well, he's like, Himeno, he's like, was I close with her? And he sits down in the basket. He's like, I haven't been crying at all, though, have I? But Denji's kind of... And I like the guy like closes his eyes and get introspective. Denji's not really had a reason to cry because he's not really close with these people. Again, we talk about that pyramid, right? We talk about that pyramid of needs. And we have all the basic needs here. And we do that. And then we do... Like relationships, relationships, and like self actualization up here. So Dingy, he's been in this part down here for most of the season, and he started to come up here into the relationships, but he's just barely cracked the surface. He's not really. I would say the the person he's most connected to in this series so far is Power of all people, and she and him, they're not, they don't they don't mourn each other, right? And so he says that when Pachita died, I was pretty damn sad. And that's the thing. He said I was really sad when Pachita died. And, but but he didn't cry then, right? So I think on the one hand, you can't argue that Dingy has maybe become more devil than human at this point. But I don't think that impacts whether or not he's crying over him or no. I think it's the fact that he's kind of just... He spent his whole life surrounded by death and destruction. He is kind of desensitized to it, right? He doesn't have, he hasn't built those connections. Like with Aki, Aki builds those connections and he wants to and he gets close to people and it's kind of his weakness as he gets close to people and he takes it so personally, right? Whereas Dingy, it just, it's like oil on, it's like water on oil. It just slides on off. It's like water on a duck wing. It just slides right off. And he says, but Himeno's dead. And then he sees her and he's like, she's the first person who ever wanted to be my friend. Am I shitty? Well, not really, because even though she wanted to be your friend, you guys barely just became friends, right? I feel like it's kind of the, it's like the anti-Nakama, right? You know, in some shonen, you know a character for, for two days and then they're gone and it's supposed to be this big thing. I, I'm going to bring up another series real quick and I'm going to try not to spoil it. But it's a series my brother had me watch, like, before I even started the channel. And um, <laughs> I have, like, a love-hate relationship with it. Um, it's called Seven Deadly Sins. <laughs> I don't care for it, really. There's a lot of problems with it for me. Um, and one of those problems is that, like, there's... I was watching the series with him, and without spoiling anything, there was a character in it that died, and my brother was really sad about it. He's like, isn't that the saddest thing? And I'm like, yeah, but we've only known them for, like... Two episodes. <laughs> it's like, and the characters were all super sad that they died in the show. And I'm like, we haven't spent any time at all with this character. And I was like, I was not emotionally connected. And my brother very much was. And I was like, nah, I'm not feeling it. <laughs> I was being dingy in that moment. But that's kind of the thing. You know, in a lot of series, even if you're with a character for a short amount of time, the show expects you to have that, you know, connection with that character so that when they die, it's really sad. And him and dying is really sad you know for us the audience because we've gotten inside him and O's head and we've seen kind of her a little bit more introspectively than dingy has but dingy really doesn't have any reason to be sad about her dying i mean it, it is sad because you know it's a person dying but he only had that one meal on the veranda with her when they decided to be friends it's like i don't think he should feel shitty and then he questions like would i cry if power died and he's like doubt it <laughs> Granted, she's tried to kill him how many times? He's like, eh. But then he thinks about it. He's like, what about Aki? He's like, what if he died? Probably not. Which is, that part's rather interesting because Aki was like laying down life and limb for him. Laying down life and limb for him back at the hotel and was super emotional about Denji not dying. And Denji's like, eh, you know? And then he thinks about Makima. 
And he's like, what if Makima died? And he says, I mean, I'd probably mourn her for three days, but then I'd have three square meals and baths and a good night's sleep, and that's pretty awesome, so he wouldn't be that sad. And that part's kind of crazy, right? That part's kind of crazy that he wouldn't really mourn them. But he hasn't really developed any of these attachments to them. And that's curious. And so part of it is like, well, and I love that he grabs his heart. And he's like, maybe my heart's gone in more than one way. And Denji kind of has this realization that maybe, maybe it's not just that Pochita has taken his heart. It's this swap to keep him alive. But he might have taken some of his humanity too. But I would argue that it's not just Pachita. It's just the lifestyle he's been involved in the past most of his life, right? It's, yeah, you could say that it's Pachita becoming his heart that's made him more devilish. Especially in terms of like being immortal and all that. But I think that the lifestyle he's lived, like being used by the Yakuza to hunt devils and not having a home, not having a family, not having, you know, someone that, to comfort him or communicate with him, that all plays a big part too. And I think that that desensitized him just as much as having a devil latch onto your heart. So, so yeah, there's that. Mm-hmm. He's like, what do I, and I like that Dingy takes a moment to kind of reflect on this. I like that. And then he looks up to Power, and of course Power is like, <laughs> Power's sitting there enamored with the vending machines as she always is. And then Dingy says, why bother taking it so seriously? He's like, this stuff is no fun, so thinking about it's bound to be a buzz kill. So there's that aspect too, right? I, mm, there's that aspect, and Dingy's going to come back to that thought later. But it's the idea that thinking... Thinking on, you know, like, quote-unquote, real and serious, existential, existential things, that is hard. That's this stuff up here. We don't want to focus on that. That's a buzzkill. <laughs> yeah, thinking about stuff that involves, like, self-actualization and yourself and your humanity and existential stuff, like, that's going to be depressing. I won't worry about that. Let's live for the present. Let's 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 live about let's think about the fun stuff instead. Cuz thinking about the other stuff's hard. Like that that's such a statement and that's such a message Fujimoto's giving of like, yeah, that stuff is the difficult things to focus on. So then we have Tendo and the other one, um was it Kusabe come in? Right? And I like the Aki's like, "Who the hell are you?" I like the Aki doesn't know these people. He's like, "Who are you?" Who are you, Hanji Jr. and Levi, Hanji and Levi 2.0? Who are you all? And it says Makima's asked him to help coach the special division. And he's like, coach? And I, I like the one guy's like, you need that apple? Can I have it? And Aki's like, everybody's just coming in here trying to steal my food. <laughs> I, I just, I'm the one that half died here. Thank you for stealing all my apples. I didn't need those carbohydrates and sugar. You are welcome. And he's like, coach? And then we have the intro, right? But we don't get to find that out immediately. Instead, we go to Suda and the ravens on all of the gravestones. And so Makima says it is clear that the enemy is after Denji. And thus, we, which is why we want to strengthen Division 4. So Makima has plans. Makima has big old plans here. That she wants to... I guess I'm going to put her down here because it's not really expectation versus reality. Makima wants to strengthen Division 4. Now, the question about strengthening Division 4, I think, has to do with how much does Aki know, how much does Makima know about what's happening with Aki? Because I would assume she has sent uh, Tendo and the other guy to talk to Aki about his options. But she knows that Aki's not going anywhere. So she probably knows that they're setting him up with a contract with the future devil. So what is Makima? Again, Makima's plan is like shrouded behind this Oz-like curtain, right? Like what is it? What is exactly happening? And again, I feel like I don't even think we're going to find out this season. 
I don't. I think maybe it'll get hinted at what Makima's goals are, but I don't think we're finding that out this season. I think it's going to be hinted at just enough to bug you, and then we're going to have to wait. But we'll see. But she looks kind of frightful in the scene where she's walking to the cemetery. She looks a bit creepy. She's just walking, like, with these dead eyes with Dingy and Power trailing behind. And she's like, most of its agents are dead. And I like that Dingy's like, are you going to transmit Makima? And she's like, I'm going to be too busy. Har, har, har. So I'm going to introduce you to the perfect teacher. He's going to train you. I'm assuming that the grave that he's standing in front of is, is Himeno's, but I don't know. I also noticed, like, posture-wise, like, like, Power always has something untucked and Dingy always looks kind of, like, disheveled. Makima stands, like, perfect every time. Like, prim, proper, perfect. It's very creepy. It's too perfect, right? It's too, too put on, too perfect. And yeah, so then we get Suda's character. And she just stands there and she... It's like his name is, but he won't, he won't let us know his name. Mm hmm He tells her to be quiet. Answer my questions. I'm, it's like, come ye, answer these three questions, three. It's like, he's like the guy off the bridge from Monty Python, the Holy Grail. He says, what is your name? What is your favorite color? What is the airspeed velocity of a laden swallow? That's literally what he asks them. But he says, how do you feel about your comrades dying? Because these three questions are going to let him know, are you worth my time or are you going to die instantly? And so he says, how do you feel about comrades dying? And then she's like, okay. And she's like, I've thought they've died. <laughs> They're not affected. Not affected. And he's like, okay. Two, do you want revenge? No. Then she says, nah, that shit's depressing. Mm-mm. And she says, verily. Yeah, so, which is refreshing, right? It is refreshing that our protagonist in the series does not desire revenge whatsoever. Again, that expectation. You would think that Dingy would maybe want revenge or would have some desire to go after the gun devil versus no. Nope. Not at all. He's just doing what Makima tells him to do. And so then Suda's character asks the third question, which is humans or devils? Which side are you on? And that gets their attention. Because you have, you have power, who is a devil inhabiting a human's corpse. And you have Dingy, who is a human who has taken on a, you know, parasitic devil. So whose side are you on? And Dingy goes... Whichever one's going to take care of me and whichever one is winning. So for power, power's on the winning side, which explains why she flew the coop. And Dingy is for who will take care of me. That is volatile extremely volatile, right? Because with power, if somebody gets the upper hand in a battle, power can switch sides. And it's like, nope, this is it. And then in Denji's case, as long as Division 4 and Makima are taking care of him, we're fine. But if he finds out Makima has alternative interests or if she's associated with the Yakuza, he does that we've established Denji does not like the Yakuza, especially the grandpa, because he didn't like the Blade Devil's talk of it back in the restaurant. So if he finds out Makima's been with this group and she doesn't have his best interests in mind and isn't taking care of him, Bachita, he said he wouldn't mourn her death, but maybe for three days. I that's interesting that he would say whichever side's taking care of me. And thus Makima takes care of him. Hmm. Fun times. Okay. And so I like that Suda with flask in hand, he like looks at him and then says, you two get full points. You're the kind of crazy that I want. He says, you're a rare breed and that's fantastic. And the way he says it is so monotone that you wonder if he's being sarcastic or not. But I think he's being serious. He's like, no. He's like, he thinks Aki's, he thinks Aki's a little shit because he's too emotional and wants revenge. And he, Aki answered all the questions not the way he would have answered them. If he says, how do you feel when your partners die? 
Aki cries over them. When he says, how do you feel about revenge? Aki's doing everything for revenge. And when he says, how do you feel about humans and devils? Aki is solely on the side of humans. So for Sudo's character, it's like, that would not be the correct answer. So it's interesting. He says, you're all fantastic. And he says, I love it. I, want, I wondered if he had a contract with, like, a love devil or something, because he says, I love this and I love that, like, in sequence. Why not? And I love Power's, like, Power looks over to Makima, like, why have you set us up with this weirdo? Right? She's like, I am frightened. <laughs> He's like, Makima, you head on back. I'm starting with them right now. A man is terrifying when he tells Makima. Makima. The woman that just, you know, finger molded her way out of 30 guys last episode and crushed them into oblivion. When he tells her to head on back and she doesn't bat an eye. Okay. Sure. And she's like, okay. Like, I'll leave it to you. And he's like, wait, Makima. And then that's why he hugs them. I'm a devil hunter from Special Division 1. Meaning the first division, right? The question is, has he been here since the start of the divisions? Is he the eldest or was he assigned to number one because it's the best division? It's like, I love it when people call me teacher. So that's what you're going to call me. Yeah, there's something connected to love and his ability, right? Something's connected to it. And he says, I love booze, women, and killing devils. And his eyes are just soulless. What the fudge? Okay. And then she's like, huh? And she's like, what? And then he like hugs them and crushes them and breaks their neck. But then she's like, we can't stand up. And he says that he brought this blood with him, right? And so he gives it to Dingy and Power. And he's like, with a little blood, you'll be right as rain. And the fact that Dingy drinks it and doesn't think anything about it is like definitely a sign that he's, you know, maybe a little bit more devil than human. Okay. But he brought this blood bag to give them so he could beat the shit out of them. And he's like, what the hell was that, man? And he's like, Makima asked me to train you too. So this, this training montage, this training arc, you know, the training arc where we learn life lessons and we learn about, you know, the enemy and about what it means to this and that. No, he's literally going to kill them until they're able to fight back against him. Nope. He is going to kill them until they learn. Because he basically establishes that they're pretty much immortal. Which is good for Dingy and Power, but what the fudge. And he says he's never trained humans. But he's, no, he's trained humans, but he's never trained devils before. And then when he said, I'm not sure why, but the gun devil is after your heart. I'm like, because he loves Vegeta. <laughs> So the fact that you're a scrub who gets his ass kicked a lot is a problem. And he says, I'm the best devil hunter there is. And if you can beat me, you're the strongest devil. All right. So we've got to basically fight this character whose name shall not be said until we're able to beat him. And it does not bode well for them. He's like, you two have no rights here. I don't care if I bash your head in or not. And so I like this comparison. He says, when I was little, I used to break my toys a lot because I was too strong. So we established with his character that he's a little bit sadistic. But he's going to be using Dingy and Powie as toys to whip them into shape and make them into badasses. Okay. He's a bit scary, right? And of course, I love that we end that he looks back and he's like, with my help, you're going to be a pair of serious badasses. He's like, that's my job. I, I want to make note that the blood coming out of power and dingy forms a heart. <laughs> Which again, is it tied to love? Is his, is his devil tied to love? I don't know. That's my headcanon. My headcanon is his devil's tied to love or vices, right? Because love can be a vice, liquor can be a vice, cigarettes can be a vice. I, I, my, my theory is maybe his devil contract is tied to vices somehow. But, there, but the blood makes a heart. Mm, I, th I think his devil's tied to something with that, but we don't know for sure. Okay. So in any case, 
We can't summon Cone. He tries to summon Cone, and he doesn't appear. And I was afraid of it first, and we put the chairs back up in the manga in the corner. And he tries to summon her again. A no-show. The fox devil's mad at you for having it bit off too much. So, yeah. So, we have the idea that the fox devil... The fox devil is maybe not gone. Maybe not gone. But is mad at Aki for making it eat the blade devil. It's like you had me eat something awful and then I got hurt. So I'm not talking to you anymore. So Aki can't really use Cone right now. Which is sad because I like Cone's design and everything. But it's mad at him. And then the blade devil. It probably won't help you out ever again. So we've lost Cone. That's... Sad days. He has two years left to live and he can't use Cone anymore. Fujimoto, how dare you? And so he says, and that sword's from the Cursed Devil, right? How many more times can you use it? And Aki doesn't answer the question. So Aki is keeping his two years of living lifespan a secret. He's not telling anybody. He's keeping it a secret. Okay. Probably because he doesn't want anybody to worry about him, right? Or make it seem like they don't want anybody to know, right? It's his business. And so he wants to know what they mean by coaching. And the one guy's like, yeah, so we're here to provide job consultation with the human members of the special division. And so she says, Tendo's like, do you think you might quit right now while the going's good? They're basically telling Aki, they're like, look, are you in or out? This is your chance. This is your chance out. If you want to take it, do it. Because they're like, at this point, your main devil that was your biggest asset, Cone, is not helping you anymore. They're like, nope. And there is a question of whether Cone's even still alive or not. Because Arai is dead, so we can't ask Arai. So we don't know about the other people that have contracts with Cone. But he's lost Cone. He can't use the curse devil much more because he's only got two years left. So he's really, he needs more curse options. He needs to make more contracts, which is funny because at the start of this reaction, I was like, Aki doesn't need any more contracts. And now it's like, he needs a contract. It's like, damn it. So uh, Tindo says, you know, now might be the time to get out while the going's good. You know, maybe you should leave. Maybe you should hang it up. There's already someone who's gone private from your division, so you wouldn't be the only one. If you're serious about staying on board, you're going to make sacrifices. And I was like, ha, ha, ha. I was like, like, Aki hasn't made sacrifices. Like, his partner's dead. He has two years of his life left. He's been sacrificing bits and pieces of him as we go. Like, he's sacrificed quite a bit already, right? And he's like, sacrifices. And he's like, yes, if you stick around, you're going to need contracts with even stronger devils so you can actually contribute. So the thing is, they're like, Aki, you are not a fiend. You are not a devil yourself. You're just a human. So if you're going to stick around, Makima's got plans brewing and they'll probably be pretty big. And if you're going to stick around and help, then you have to be able to contribute. And you can't contribute with a cursed sword that just takes away your lifespan every time you use it. That's not contributing. That's going to get you just killed and then we're stuck with nothing. You need a strong devil. You can quit public safety and enjoy however long you have left if you want. Or you can stay and go through hell. And the devil that killed my family. And I love that Aki's like, look, the devil that killed my partner and my family are out there. Still. Why exactly would I quit? I love how, like, his eyes, he gets so wide-eyed, and he's like, why would I leave? Like, if I left, what would I have? He's like, I don't have a family. I don't have a partner. What would I go do for the two years left of my life? No. Like, like it's he just batters down, right? I just, God, that face that he makes. It's so, like, I've got two years left. Like, hell, I'm going to just go spin it in the Kokomo's. And Tendo and the guy, they seem pleased by that response. They're like, okay, fine. Then you'll come with us. We're going to head back for now. And they tell him to look objectively at where he's standing. 
And as they leave, this other girl comes in, right? And I love, again, there's that Neon Genesis crossing the threshold. That Neon Genesis moment of like crossing into the room, right? And she comes in into his space. And the moment he looks and sees who she is. Mm -hmm. But the thing of it is, is that she probably looks like him and oh. And so he probably was like, who are you? And he like literally leans into her, right? I, I love the gesture of him leaning into her like he's seen a ghost. But if it's her sister, she probably looks like her. And that's what, so you could tell like maybe he did like her, right? Meanwhile, it's nighttime and the teacher has been there the whole time. And he's like, I'm going to your place tomorrow. See ya, walk home safe. Doesn't offer like, like the mentor figure. The mentor figure here, in any other shonen, the mentor figure would like get him a bowl of soup, bring him into his home, tell him a story, give him some exposition from the past to like make him feel more understanding of what's going on. No! This guy like kicks him to the curb in a graveyard and's like, I'm coming to your place tomorrow. Hope you make it there before I do. Peace up, A Town. Bye. And then just leaves them in a bloody heap. And I love the powers just sitting there like, oh my god. Like, they, they've not left that area. They've stayed in that area all day getting killed over and over again by him. And he acts like nothing's happened. Right? This part is very odd. Where he, like, starts to, like, blip out. Like, he literally is, like, short circuit. Right? Where she looks at him and he just, like, sits there and starts to, like, drool and freak out and she's just like what are you doing like it's so bizarre that she just like he like starts to feel pain almost and she's like your brains is your brain not sorted out yet heal 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 damn you i'm like power maybe not bashing him in the head is the best way to make him heal but she's she basically treats him like a tv set she's like come on work and she like gets him to <laughs> gets him to turn back on it's great and finally after she bashes him enough times, then he goes back to normal. And he's like, oh, he like snaps out of it. And he's like, how many times did I die today? And she's like, at least 20. And she's like, but I was passed out for some of it, so I don't know. I was unconscious, so I can't know for sure. Like, they just got killed over and over again. And so we have this conversation as they're walking back on the highway, which I love the shot of the two of them on the highway together. I love that they're on the highway and it's just like the open road around them and it's such a beautiful visual. It's very cinematic. It's it's great, right? And Power says that the old fool is too fearsome. And Deji said that if this keeps up, it's going to suck all the fun out of life. Again, making them think of, of stuff beyond just the basic needs, right? It's going to suck all the fun out. I was working hard because I wanted to enjoy life. So Dingy was like, I was giving it my all because it meant for a better life, right? So Dingy, Dingy wants a reward for his hard work. Because, yeah, if you think about it, so far, when we started the series, Dingy... He didn't want to owe any more debts because he wanted a chance at a life where he could, like, enjoy things. So that's why he worked really hard against the zombie devil. And then he wanted to basically grab some boobs and get acquainted with Makima. And so that's what he's been working towards with all of his missions so far. And he's been doing it to have, like, an, e an easy, simple life. But now the teacher is bringing up things that are more complicated and make things a bit harder to deal with. And then she's like, I don't want to worry about this. So it's interesting, right? It's very interesting. He's like, I having to deal with this is total bullshit. Denji does not want to be an adult. He doesn't want an adult. It's like. And she's like, well, shall we run away then? And he's like, no, if we run away, then that's going to be bad because public safety is going to come after us and we'll get the for real devil treatment. Like, they're not getting the for real devil treatment now because they're working with the public safety. He's like, if we leave now, we're going to be screwed. No. And then he, they just, I love that he's lost his shirt throughout this battle. Like, he doesn't have it anymore. And they both just kind of stare at the winding road like they're thinking about what to do. These two 
individuals on the open road together sharing a brain cell. <laughs> and he's like, that drunk asshole. He's like, I can't believe he's treating us like toys. It's pissing me off. He's mad about it. And then she's like, I have it! I love it. She's like, he's like, how to defeat him. She's like, as fierce as he may be, ultimately his mind is addled by spirits. I thought their big thing was to take away his liquor. I thought their plan was going to be to take his liquor away from him. And then that would just, you know, give them an opening to defeat him. But they, I, I wonder if they're eventually going to get to that point. They've not made it that far yet. So it's like, okay, we need to use our heads to overcome him. And he's like, I got it. He's like, we'll outsmart him. And I'm like, these two couldn't sort their way out of a paper bag. So, but they do a pretty good job of thinking of a plan. He's like, I've been thinking how cool it would be lately if we could fight like one of those smart characters in the manga. I'm like, Dingy and Power are such dweebs. They're so dorky and they're not intelligent. I mean, they're, they're smart. They think of a fun thing in this at the end of this episode, but I'm like, they're not chess masters, right? But they're like, wouldn't it be cool if we were the smart ones? I love how it's animated. And she's like, yes, we'll slaughter him in a war of wits. And he's like, I'm feeling smarter already. I've come up with hundreds of plans. I'm like, these two are just such boobs. I love it. I love how ridiculous they are. If we put our heads together, it'd be harder for us to lose than right. Now he shall be our plaything. Oh my God. I love you can tell. Even without the sound on, you can tell who is talking based on the language. It's absolutely wonderful. And then, yeah, from the OP, from the OP, we have Suda coming up. And then we have, he's like, oh, I think they live around here. And we have her with the, with the, she looks like Mari off of Neon Genesis now. She's upgraded from Asuka to Mari. <laughs> With the glasses and the ribbon. I'm like, oh my god, I can't. Which, Mari's more of a strategist in that series, so that kind of makes sense. Makes sense! But she's like, the old sus has arrived. The old souse. And he's like, yeah, if he wants to ruin our lives, he gets to die. I love that Dingy has the glasses on, too. Dingy's glasses look very much like Ash from Banana Fish. And hers look like Mari's from Neon Genesis. I love it. It's great. And the suit is like, welp. Here we are. And I love that even, even when, even when Power tries to dress up like Makima, because she has like the, the shirt tucked in the pants like Makima, like that's going to be her smart girl outfit. She doesn't quite get it all tucked in and it's hanging out. The highly cerebral warfare. Oh my God. And Dingy's got like the axe in his mouth. Oh my God. It's amazing. And then she makes a spear. Girl, if she named that spear just a little bit lower, she would have got him. A little bit. If she named it a little bit lower, she could have got him. But nope. He's like a blood weapon. Uh-uh. And then, or maybe she thought that that was to distract him. I'm like, if they were a little bit faster, because yeah, she had the two liter set up. If it was, she was a little bit faster, she could have controlled it and done it while he was, she should have just been faster and that could have maybe got him. But no, he punches his way out of it. And then he manages to dodge Dingy's attack and hit him with the axe. And he's like, that was your best effort. And he's like, okay. I guess Prey will use its head when it's cornered. And then he pulls the bait and switch. He makes you think that he's going to leave him for the day, right? And he says that Makima gets anemic when, or Power gets anemic when she's low on blood. And he's like, well, you guys are good. Maybe you'll learn something. And then, nope, he throws a knife and gets him. And the knife lands, like, right where the chainsaws come out. And then she's like, uh-huh, like, what? What are we doing? And then he collapses and he says, beasts shouldn't trust anything a hunter says. And then Dingy collapses and that's the episode. Ah! Ah! Okay. Ah, okay. <laughs> so lots of things set up, and that's not even the end of the episode. You think it's the end of the episode. That's what I thought it was, but no. And when we started going down the escalator, again, very much like Nerve, going down to Central Dogma, very much going down into the, the bowels of hell, I thought it was the start of the ED. I was like, oh, it's the start of the ED here. Cool. But no. They tell Aki that they're going to have to, they're like, we're not doing this to mess with you, all right? 
we're doing this because you'll be jumping into a lion's cage when you get back to work. So they're establishing that Aki is going to be in a very dangerous situation. So Aki needs a strong contract to protect himself. Okay. So they're like, we need to get you set up with a very strong contract so that you can be protected. Right? He's like, that means you need a weapon to protect yourself, you know. And so they go down to this, you know, bowels of hell. And yeah, we have the 108, which again, ties back to that number eight, right? That we have with the eternity devil. Again, eternity and future, right? So there's that fear of, fear of eternity, fear of time going on without you, fear of things outlasting you, right? So that's a fear in itself. But then fear of the future, that seems like a perfect thing to tie with Aki because Aki, Aki, I don't think has fear of the future anymore because he's like, I have two years left. I just got to do what I can before I die to try to kill the gun devil. So we go down in this pit where the devils that the public safety captures alive are kept. So that's interesting. So there could be a chance that power or dingy could end up down here if they're not careful, right? It is suggested or alluded to, correct? They're like, let's find you the right weapon. And they walk past the grates and everything. I love that when they have these awesome suits on, and yet they also have, like, converse <laughs> with them. And so the one guy asks, it's none of my business, but who is the pretty lady? Was that your girlfriend? And I like that Tendo's like, come on, mind your own business. Leave him alone. And Aki says, no, it was her sister. It was him and O's sister. She gave me a letter. Because, yeah, they ask if she, like, smacked him. And he's like, no. And they're like, a letter. And then Aki flashes back to it. She saw it. She gave him several letters, like a bunch of them. Right? They were all from her. And she's like, this is a letter that my sister sent me. And she said, I'm giving it to you because I think you should read it. And so, for the most part, a lot of the letter talks about their dad. And that their dad's not well. And they're getting a medication. So I want to go back through and read the letter and see what it says. I'm glad they translated it because at first I was like, am I going to need somebody to translate that page in Japanese for me? And Aki's like reading through it. He's like, is dad feeling any better? And saying, the job, pray, the job pays pretty well, so don't worry about sending food or anything. Dad's been messaging me lately. I appreciate his concern, but I'm more worried about him. Is he taking his meds? So their dad's not in good health. Right, and she, and him and O is concerned and wants to make sure he's okay. And then she, the letter goes on, as Aki's reading it, I forced Aki to get his ear pierced. So she was the, she was the influence, right? The peer pressure. And he's like, oh, and then he reads it. If nothing else, we could go private instead of staying in public safety. How do I get Aki to quit? I brought it up, but he just brushed it off. Showing that she wanted them to go together. Meaning that she cared for him. She cared for him and she liked him. It's uh, it's such a great way of telling the audience. And telling. It's a great way for showing us the audience. Aki figuring out that she liked him. Without the cliche coming out and saying that she liked him. Because I said a few episodes back when she died. I was like oh well Dingy knows that she liked Aki. So now Dingy. I was expecting dingy to tell Aki in the hospital about him and O liking him. I was expecting that, but no. Instead, he finds out through the letter and it's not even, there's no big confession. There's no big, like, there's no heartwarming like, I love him so much. There's nothing like that. She, she brings up the fact that she wanted them to go to the private sector, which tells Aki that she wanted to keep him safe, which tells Aki that she liked him, right? And he, like, slowly goes through the letter and his, like, mouth kind of trembles. She's like, I don't think it's a good idea to keep working here. If nothing else, we could go private instead of staying in public safety. How do I get Aki to quit? I brought it up, but he just brushed it off. I was trying to be serious, too. Meaning that she wanted to keep him safe. And so now, she's gone. And so he's like, well, what have I got to lose? It's like, I've lost my family. I lost the girl that liked me. I've got two years left to live. 
I need to make them count. He's like, I could sit back and do nothing or I can make them count. And that's kind of his part. I will be honest, the animation of them walking down in the cellar is a little wonky. It's a little wonky, just a wee bit. It's probably the, uh, this, an, this anime has had amazing animation so far, but that's probably been the wonkiest out of all the episodes, but it's only for like 30 seconds, so it's nothing. And then they get to room 108. So, they say, you're going to contract with the devil in this room. They don't even give him a choice. They're like, no, this is the one you're going to go to. We'll, we'll find you the weapon. It's the future devil. There are two people in public safety that have contracts with it. So, that's curious. There are two, two people, two with future devil contracts. All right curious and they say they, they explain that for one of them one had to give up half their lifespan okay so one was half the lifespan i'm wondering if the future devil if kobini is one that's made a contract with the future devil maybe maybe one had to give up half their lifespan and the other gave up both eyes along with their sense of taste and smell Hmm. Hmm. And one gave up eyes and sense of taste and smell. Ha. Huh. Okay. So these two individuals that also made contracts with the future devil could be nobody. Could be nobody that we know of. Could be no one that we know of for sure. All right. Um, could be that. I don't think it's Suda's character, because even though his eyes seem kind of dead or whatever, he does... I mean, why would he drink the alcohol if he can't taste it, right? Unless it's just for the effects. But I don't think it's Suda's character. I don't think it's him. I don't think it's Madoka. I don't think it's either of these two. But, so who's left in public safety? I think Kobini could be one of them. Maybe Kobini gave up half of her lifespan to be with the future devil. Maybe because at this point, Kobini didn't have a lot of options. So, and maybe that's why she doesn't talk about it. I don't know. Um, also, uh, theorizing, maybe Makima made the contract with the future devil. Maybe Makima is the one. Maybe the eyes that she has are not her eyes. They're fake. Maybe she had to give her eyes and they're fake eyeballs. And she can't taste or smell. So, her hugging Dingy back when he stunk and everything and her not even caring about him smelling maybe it was because of the contract she made with the future devil she can't taste anything so the chupa chups and all that maybe none of that matters and she talks about the food and dining on it and how she doesn't seem to really care about the delicacies and things like that maybe it's because she can't taste or smell because of the future devil contract i don't know but i that would be interesting if Makima made the contract with the future devil and she lost her eyes so she has the fake ones in and if she can't taste or smell so that stuff with Dingy, she didn't care because it didn't, his like state of being didn't affect her. Hmm. Hmm. And maybe that's why she didn't have any problem drinking. I don't know. I don't know. Even though that doesn't affect your alcohol tolerance whether you can taste or not. But interesting. So I'll be curious. I'll be curious to see. Obviously, I don't want any spoilers, but I'll be curious to see if we find out who the other two that have contracts are and what this devil ends up taking from Aki. If it takes half Baki's lifespan, he'll only have one year left. So then what do we do with that? But if it takes, what else will it take from him? I don't know. They're like, maybe if you're lucky, you'll get a bargain. And he just goes in and they're like, mm. And then we see it's just an eyeball. It's literally just an eye staring at him. Oh, how creepy. And it just looks at him. And like seems to get closer. Ugh. Creepy, 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 creepy. And so yeah, we get the we get the ED. I really like the ED has kind of like a lo-fi sound to it. I really like it. I like that it's a bunch of dogs. And everything's like, it's like real footage that's been superimposed and it's been reversed. I like it. It's fun. And we see some of the devils from previous episodes. And we see the jam and all that. Fun times. Fun times. 
And that's it. It's really good. I like that episode. Dogland by People One. Cool. And just does parkour throughout all of it. So yeah. Battered and bruised. Or bruised and battered. So yeah, very interesting episode. Lots to think about as far as the morals with Dingy and power and where they are morally. How much of them are human, how much of them are devil. I like that there's this big giant contrast between Aki, who's literally like a shonen protagonist at this point, and Dingy, who is the least shonen protagonist ever. I love it though. And so I like that they're being trained in, in a training arc only Fujimoto could come up with. And then Makima's off to do business elsewhere <laughs> to plot her next plans, right? The one guy that knew what she was, that had suspicions of her is no longer in the public safety. So, dude, okay. And then, meanwhile, we only have two episodes left. Knowing this show, though, the next two episodes are going to be ridiculous and batshit crazy. But how? That's the question, right? And what's the deal with this future devil? Uh, maybe is it the devil that's left in the OP? Maybe. I want to go back to the OP real quick and check because really it's the only devil we have not seen yet, to be honest. So yeah, we have Pachita and them. We have, okay. But we don't see an eye with that devil. We just see it dancing, looking all creepy as all get out with like trees and stuff. Weird. And we did see the ghost devil and then, um, and the blade devil. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, we haven't seen what that last devil is. Maybe it's the future devil, but then it doesn't look like we don't see the eye though. So, and we don't know about the angel too. I was really expecting it would be the angel down in the cellar that he would go make a contract with, but no, nah. -uh, so, hmm. I guess we'll find out, right? I, what I like about this episode is that leaving it, I have no clue what to expect next, which I like. I like going in blind. Like, this episode was a lot of fun because we have no clue what to expect, but we'll see, won't we? Hmm. So, I'm curious to know your thoughts down below. Please, no spoilers, hints, or clues, but I'm curious to know what you thought of this episode. And, yeah, guys, we got next week and the week after. We got two more weeks left. Rounding out 2022 with Chainsaw Man. I, I'm excited. So in the meantime, I hope you all have a wonderful week. Please stay safe. Take care. And yeah, I'll be back next week with episode 11 of Chainsaw Man. Bye.